Welcome. Thank you once again for hanging out with us. This is the one and only IT in the D show. We've made it all the way to episode 419. I'm your host, Bob Walton Spiel, always here with producer Randy Walker. Guest this week, IT security manager at the Shift Group, former CISO Emerit and former guest of the show, one of our favorites, Jason Brown, is in the house. You can find us online, IT in the D.com. Do us a favor, give us a like on the socials, subscribe to us everywhere, find podcasts or sold. Don't forget. Uh, ne- starting next year, we're going to be in Royal Oak for the first three months. Yield Saloon. Go to meetup.com slash IT in the D. And you can, uh, can you, can you RSVP there and they give you updates or I don't want to, yep. I don't want to hate sending spam. So um, I forget how they send it out, but yeah, meetup.com slash IT in the D and uh, we'll be in Royal Oak and we're figuring out where to go the next three months. So m- might go back to Nancy whiskeys, but um, don't know yet. So I was surprised how many people signed up as soon as I created those events. That's great. Was, yeah. I think there's what like two thousand members on Meetup. Yeah, about twenty eight hundred, I think. Yeah, Royal. We got to go back to Royal Oak. That's where we used to have. You know, now that Blackfin's closed, there's really no place we can go. Um, and I think Hamlin's now City Tavern or something. I don't know. I guess I got to go there. We got to go there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll see how Yield works and then expand from there. Fair enough. Fair enough. But Jason, how you doing, man? How's everything? Yeah, man, doing good. Doing good. Thank you for thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So. I mean, diving right in. Last we saw you, you, you know, you're the CISO over at Merit Networks Service Provider. Yeah. Um, you, you then went to Aptive, mm-hmm. and and now you're at Shift Group. So, ta- I guess let's dive in. You know, just like they did to you at your work now, um, and talk to me about the difference between where your mind's at when you're in, you know, service provider world versus government world versus private sector world. Oh I mean, goodness! Loaded question, right? It's, it's completely different. It, it really is. You know, it, one of the things at, at Merit that I, I really enjoyed doing was developing uh, coursework and, and um, uh, doing interviews and, and development of, of um, you know, just an overall security program for everybody to, to consume and take advantage of. Whereas, you know, when I was working at Aptiv and even, you know, here at, at the Shift Group, um, developing the security programs from, you know, basically from nothing, building them from the ground up. It, uh, it's, it's a complete mind shift. It really is. But it's a lot of fun. I mean, the security field is always a lot of fun. There's, there's a lot of things to, to do, learn, and, and you never get bored. So. I can anticipate, I mean, government's more compliance and regulation, right? Um, private yeah. sector is, is, is just protecting data, period, I, you know. Um, at the end of the day, um, while you're a service provider, you're kind of, you know, trying to keep a network up per se. So it's kind of, a, you know, going in every day. It's, you know, I think you, you complete mindset shift, but at the same end of the day, it's still this, kind of the same, right? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was funny at the state, and, and you're right, you had to learn just about every compliance requirement under the sun. I mean, from criminal justice to working with the FBI and uh, state police to, you know, IRS and, and publication 1075, which was always one of our favorites, you know, um, dealing with, with the Treasury Department every couple of years was, was something else. But, um, you know, working at Merit and being a service provider, you were taking care of more than just the hundred and so employees that you had there, right? I mean, you were taking care of all of your your customers, your members, your your friends, your relatives, you know, because we were dealing with nonprofits, nonprofit hospitals, um, and and just ensuring that you know the lifeblood really is the internet now. I mean, could you imagine doing this without the internet right now? I mean, could you imagine doing this podcast without the internet right now? With COVID, I don't think I don't think we'd be in the IT business. Not. We right. wouldn't be in the IT business. We'd be working at our dad's tool and die shop, you know? Yeah. Exactly. So it's, um, I, I mean, it, it's the complete lifeblood. It, it's a new commodity. It, it really is. It, it really needs to be there with uh, electricity and water and, and everything else. It, it really needs to be there for everybody to use. We talk, so, I said, we, you know, no, I wanted to bring up and, you know, I, I got a couple of things actually. One of them, I got to bring this up because, uh, I was just talking about before the show, um, when the pandemic hit, me and two of my friends I grew up with were big into Call of Duty. And uh, the one map is going away, so everybody's sad. It's, it's, it's a sad week for everybody. But 
the interesting part of that is, you know, they come out with there's hackers ruin the game. If, if anyone that's played it for a minute knows that, you know, at one point or another, you got hit by a hacker and it ruined your whole day or game. And um, as soon as they come out with an anti cheat, the hackers are literally come out with a, a, a new cheat two days later. Um, mm-hmm. It's typical with, you know, here you have all these vendors that you have to work with, right? The t- from, from Palo Alto to Cisco to Microsoft and on down. And it seems like every time they get a, they try to get one step ahead, you know, somebody's figuring out a way to, to, to backdoor that, um, you know, what, how do you stay on top of it? Because obviously, you know, you got the vendors are, you got your best interest in mind, right? Um, the hackers are trying to do what they do. They're going to hack. Um, they want, they want to grab your data. They want to hold a ransom. They want to, you know, um, do whatever they want to do. But I mean, how do, how do you stay on top of it? I, it literally is everything that I do. It's everything that, that I am, you know, I get up every morning, read the news. I've got a, a website that I use for my RSS feeds. So I read all my, my uh, tech smut and, uh, and then just, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that we've got a subscription to, you know, some of the, the big research firms that are out there for cybersecurity and IT and just in general, you know, the foresters, the gardeners and stuff like that. Um, I had the, the privilege to go to Black Hat a couple of years ago, um, when, you know, when uh, before the pandemic hit and got to listen to re- some really good talks. And, and I love going to Gurkhan. You know, anybody that's in the Michigan, in Michigan area or, you know, in the Great Lakes area, you know, check out Gurkhan every October. You know, they put on a hell of a show. Um, but and that's you know, where that, the that's where the I mean, to be candid, that's where the nerds go. Um, yeah, it's very it's very vendor small um, yeah. and shows he's small. It's very content driven. It's a great show. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Chris Roberts comes every year and he made a comment, you know, when I was standing there talking to him, he goes, I love this show. I, I do because these are my people. And, and, you know, it's, it's not the RSA's conference, you know, where sure. all the executives go. It's, it's where you and I go to, to learn about new things. So it, um, yeah, I mean, it just it, your network as well. Your network is huge, you know, without some of the, the trade shows that have been the Metro area. You know, I, I I wouldn't know as much as I would without, you know, networking and, and talking with others. Well, that was us setting up the tables at the various shows and getting to interview hackers from, you know, Johnny Christmas to yeah. you know, the keynotes and everyone in between. You get you get some amazing stories and you develop kind of cool friendships with some people that you never would have met otherwise. Um, so, yeah, I definitely uh, I definitely love the trade trade show feel. I could do without going to Vegas ever again for a trade show. I'm not going to lie. Um, (laughs) but everything else, you know, um, one of the, this was, this just came up. I was literally reading this on LinkedIn right before the show. I got to talk about it because I think it's fascinating. And I, I guess one of the newest things that hackers are doing in the corporate world is they're, they're trying to infiltrate the playbook. All right. Now we're effed. What's the playbook. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're basically Removing those accounts first, the ones that are, you know, top, top of, you know, front line for the, you know, that go into the war room, um, getting rid of those accounts or getting, you know, or getting into their privileged account access. But then they're watching while this is going on, they're, they're watching uh, the chats are open if they, if they, once they infiltrated. So now they're looking at your, your corporate chat. Um, so basically what, you know, the, uh, he was saying was you got to create a strategy for having a backroom chat or something um, that's encrypted or back, not the main chat where you do these things. And because the, one of the comments was what made me laugh was you don't want hackers to read, you know, we can afford 10 million. Let's offer them 500,000. Hopefully they settle for two and a half million. Right. Because then they, they got you by the balls. Um, but it's just interesting now how I, you know, dare I say sophisticated because it's, you know, it's been sophisticated since day one. It's just, you know, it's how far they're going to go, but this is how far they're going. And I was trying to get, grab that playbook and, and, and literally watch your chat as it's going on. Um, yeah. Cause it wasn't that, didn't that happen to Twitter? 
didn't somebody hack into their Slack channel and the banner at the top had their God mode root password for everything? Oh, and, my God. Yeah, I can't remember if it was Twitter or, or um, one, of, one of the big companies. But yeah. Martin Martin from Stellantis put it, put it up on LinkedIn. I don't remember where exactly, but it was the screenshots of their back office chat, not of Stellantis, but, but of uh, – the, the, the article that he that he shared oh, okay. um, and just yeah and then it just started a big conversation um regarding that anyway i'll, I'll find it later oh yeah, here um, send it to me I'm, I'm interested yeah it's from sc magazine um i'll send it to randy too so you can put it in the post notes um it was ragnar ragnar locker's screen cap um basically showing they were just taking screen caps of um Oh, they've been monitoring their victims as they discussed how to respond. Um, they basically did a did a breach, and and uh, that was the hacking group. Um, but yeah, I'll send it to you. Um, but it's just interesting now um, how far this has gone. Uh, usually, it was just you know, even when ransomware first started, it was just you know, hey, I got your shit. Send me a million in Bitcoin, and I'll unlock it and send it back to you. Now it's just it's taken another life. Yeah, yeah, it really has. I mean, we've been seeing attacks recently where somebody's been actively calling everybody in the IT department and been pulling information off of our LinkedIn profiles, knowing our email addresses, who our supervisors are, and, and things like that, and trying to social engineer our employees. So they're they're getting desperate. You know, I'm, I'm scared to say, but I... I be on my toes over Christmas break, seeing that uh, that seems to be the way that hackers have been dealing with these lately is their their massive attacks come over breaks when everybody's off on vacation or off on a holiday or whatever. I mean, that's what happened during Fourth of July. That's what happened during, you know, Memorial Day weekend with the uh, the Colonial Pipeline hack. Right, right. So... So it's it's funny though, like just recently, I got my credit card got stolen, and there was I'll, but the, the hackers were stupid enough to use my email address and to order the stuff. So I so I get an email saying your order has been placed, and it was Walmart.com, right? So immediately I go, I'm not clicking shit, right? It's it's a phishing email because I go, oh, I go to Walmart first, dot com, and I see it, there's nothing's been purchased in two years online. Or on my account there. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, no big deal. An hour later, I get a thing from Flagstar saying I've had fraud on my account. I'm like, oh my God, stop it. Right. And uh, I said, no, I didn't make that purchase. So it gets canceled. Now, three more orders go through for about 200 bucks each. I've called and emailed every help at fraud at of the seller, Walmart, FedEx, UPS, whoever had it at the, you know, because they were two different shippers to stop the shipment of it. Um, Flagstar wouldn't stop it because it said pending. It didn't post yet in my mm-hmm. bank. And Walmart and, and the shipping companies were basically like nothing, complete crickets. One of them got back to me and said, you just have to wait for it to post and then dispute it with your bank. And I'm like, this is such a weird system. But it go, my whole point of this was my fear of phishing maybe stop you know got got me got right i could have probably stopped it but i blew off the emails in the beginning i could have stopped the credit card immediately and i didn't um yeah and then you know because you know when you look at it guys like we don't want to be our our names don't want to be on that list when they do fish tests in your company and so help me if your department's on top of the list it's the last you know that's 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 the fear of god in us right this is our job and we're the worst at it, you know. I've had, I've seen it happen before, where security departments were by far and clear far the worst. Um, oh yeah. But like you know, those got to be coming in. I mean, because I've heard stories of you know CFOs spoofing CEOs, knowing their calendar. Hey, I'm on a on a business trip to Europe. Can you wire me six hundred grand? You know, like going that deep. I mean, have you seen anything that crazy? You know, I, obviously you've seen phishing emails probably daily. Um, but you know, any crazy stories on that front? No. Well, yeah, I guess, yeah. So a week after I started working for Shift Group, I had a spam email come from our CEO saying, hey, can you please 
send me your cell phone number because I really need to talk to you. Random, weird email. I never had a spoof. And you just started. I had just started there. Were you even on LinkedIn then at that point that you went there? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And maybe a week I had been, I had put it on there. But yeah. So did you, what was the red flag? You caught it or did you send your cell phone? No, it, um, it was because he, it came from a Gmail account, but oh, oh. CEO, why would the CEO be emailing my personal email? At oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's so. bizarre. It came from work to your Gmail. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that is super bizarre. So, like, who's watching? You know yeah, what I mean? Like, exactly. <laughs> you know, and that was the thing. Like, I found out it was my stuff was being shipped to a house that was for sa- for sale in Louisiana, and it was super bizarre shit too. It was like this weird hand cream and like three pack baby bottles, like quantity fifty, and it was like, what in the world is? <laughs> At least buy like an iPad or something, you know what I mean? Uh, all right, Randy, we're not going over to his house late at night anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, that's uh, a bizarre. <laughs> and your order. garage is full of hand cream. What the hell is going on? The baby bottles. What the? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, completely bizarre. And you're know, like, again, I don't the stuff. You know where you, where they got it from, dude. And someone's in Louisiana. Honestly, have no idea. It probably got sold sold somewhere or some. Yeah bartender probably picked it or who knows you know, you know all the crap going on or or just you know put it as they're, they're giving it away to to people in need put your heart that way too robin hood yeah 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 get someone who's loaded i mean for crying out loud i was like oh it's christmas time i gotta, I gotta wait two weeks to get this thing put you know <laughs> are you kidding me um so that brings up uh, usually everybody that we have on here that's that's in security or talks about security i gotta ask them this question because it's kind of like the word digital transformation. You ask 20 people, you're going to get 20 distinct answers. Um, zero trust has been pitched to me 67 different ways from, from 80 different people. And I get, I get it conceptually, but everyone's got their take on it. And I, I, you know, I'm just I'm dying to know what your take is on, on what exactly it is. Or how to what to do? I'm I'm more interested to hear these other stories to see what they're peddling. That's that's what I'm curious. Some about. of it goes back to a product, no. and I don't and I don't think it's productized. No, it's it's really not. Um, I mean, zero trust is multifaceted. It's not a one size fits all kind of. Uh, marketing. It's not a one size type fits all type of technology. It's it's a methodology and a way of thinking. Um, you know, we we did a lot of zero trust at the state, obviously, because we held on to a lot of different secrets and sensitive information. Um, but you know, from a network perspective, that's what everybody thinks about from zero trust is is you got to apply it to the network. So, but I don't think it is. It's not. It's yeah. not. It, it's it's a part of it. It's not all of it. it it's definitely a part of it. Um, you know, building communities of trust, communities of interest, um, and, and micro segmentation, and, and preventing and filtering that traffic going between endpoints and servers within the network. That's what everybody's used to. Now, zero trust has got to take a completely different mind shift in order to start making a sense to a work or a workforce that is no longer, you know, stuck to their desk 24 so, seven. So Jason Bork was on a few shows ago and from C3 and basically dropped a bomb that I'm still reeling over. And he said, basically if you hardened AD, you would eliminate hundred percent of your problems. And I, I kind of was like, I understood like, to me, that's where it starts is in, in active, you know, in identity management. Yep. I'm just curious, like, what your take is on that? Like, is that where most of your problems arise from? Or It, it is. Um, you know, it, it, when you start talking about identities, you're not only talking about my identity or your identity. You're also talking about the endpoint's identity, too. 
you know, was that endpoint provided by the company? If it was, prove it to me. And how do you prove it? Well, nine times out of 10, you prove it by a digital certificate that's been installed on the laptop by the organization that provided that to you. And then you get out of the mindset of role-based authentication control or access control, and you get into attribute-based access control, which is a different way of thinking about this as well. And you apply a level of risk to the endpoint or the user that is authenticating to that service or to the network. So for instance, let's say I am Jason Brown. I have a company owned device. It was put in Intune. I've got a certificate on it and it's managed by SCCM. So from a risk perspective, I'm somewhat okay. But did I multi-factor when I was authenticating to the network? No. So that gives me so much level of trust that I can only get to non-sensitive data. Now, if I was to provide that MFA along with the rest of the equipment that I was just talking about, that gets me into all of the dense, different sensitive information that I could have access to based upon my role. I mean, you still have roles built into Active Directory to prevent you to getting from HR data to you know, IT data and so on. But it it's it's really difficult. I mean, a, a lot of a lot of people that I talk to still have the mindset of the hard outer shell with the soft inner shell, and zero trust. You blow both of those out of the water. You don't trust anything, right? Until you get that level of risk to an acceptable point, and then you say, okay. Now I will go ahead and let that device in. I'll go ahead and well, let that user in. It's a different mind shift from when we started in IT. It was trust and verify, right? It wasn't that was the motto mm -hmm. for security? And now mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, no, we're we're flipping this thing upside down. Um, yeah. Because I think it doesn't, you know, not that it doesn't work, but I think we've seen all the problems that come from it. Yeah, yeah, from you know, phishing, from uh, account takeovers. I mean. You can go ahead and, and try and block out every country besides the U.S. from authenticating, but you know you've got VPN servers now that somebody from India can then attach themselves to a VPN here in the states. You're not blocking anything from the states, so they go ahead and authenticate and they're in. And how are they able to do that? Because they they got a compromised password off of the web somewhere, and they're using that because you use the same password across 15 different websites. Yep. I was guilty of that in the past. Trust me, I changed it. But, and that was the, oh crap, I just totally lost my train of thought. That was uh, that was the thing with identities too, is is, is the amount of rogue um, administrator accounts that are have been stagnant um, that I don't think people are managing or monitoring. Um, you know, I, I, I think in every organization, you, depending from small to big, but there's, there's, I bet you there's from, from a handful to dozens and dozens and dozens of literally administrator accounts that were set up at one point for a weekend thing and never uh, dismantled or were deleted or, you know, and, and they still, they just sit now stagnant. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny. People ask me, you know, why do you, I mean, this is the third time that I've, I've, come into an organization that really didn't have a program and you know being asked how do you how do you build your strategy how do you build your your security program and and honestly if you don't know where the company started and and you know where you're currently at you're not going to be able to build that program and move it forward well there's one thing you know i believe in layering um but there's another thing that can, it can get into sprawl. Um, you probably have every vendor on the planet calling you on, on every give, any given day. Oh yeah. Um, from from Microsoft to your smallest, you know, IT vendor that has the best solution. And I'll be I'll be honest, they're probably all pretty good. Um, 
But again, it, where do you start and where do you stop? That's what that's what boggles my mind because I had a I had a conversation with it with he was more of a network engineer than he is a security engineer. But I, you know, we we had to do some compliance stuff for a client, and we put in EDR, we put in Sentinel one, and I said we should really put a SIM on top of it. You know, let's call Blue Mira, and he goes, well, we're good because we have an EDR, and I'm like, well, no, it only hits. You know, granted, he's a network guy, so he's thinking only network. And I said, no, you're you're missing the what I'm saying here. It's like a SIM and EDR is not the same thing. It's completely, you know. And, and I think you have a lot of that mindset too. That hey, if I just put this one tool in, I'm good. I don't need anything else. Yeah. And, and it's so far from the truth. But yeah. again, going back to my original point, when does layering become sprawl? Like, if you get how much is too much? You know, good question. Um, and it really comes back to risk. I mean, it it really does. You know, how many? If you're looking at third-party risk and you're doing an evaluation on a given vendor, you know where is that threshold? If you can, if you don't have that risk conversation up front with your executive staff, you'll never know when it's too much because nobody will ever know, and so and you'll end up taking on risk, organizational risk, as a, a CISO that you have no business taking um it, it's it's the business's risk it's not your risk so how do you i obviously i understand downtime right hey if our line goes down at toyota it costs us x amount per minute mm-hmm. how do you assess business risk if you've never been effed before do you see where i'm going with that how do you assess business risk if you've never taken the time to evaluate, you know, how much a, a data record would cost you if you were to lose one. Sure. sure. How would I know to, to get a, a million dollar cyber insurance policy or a $10 million cyber insurance policy without going through and, and figuring that out beforehand? Well, the, the one, the, the part I hate about it is that it's the life insurance conversation, the, what would you do if your loved one was gone tomorrow? And it's the same, but it's this IT security sales guys spin it the same way, but they don't. It's, you know what I mean? It's the same end of the day thing. What happens if you lost all your data tomorrow? Well, my company's been in business for 50 years and we've been in I, using IT for 30 and we've never lost data once. Doesn't mean you won't tomorrow, but you know what I mean? That, that's the thing. How do you assess risk? If nobody ever broke into my house, why the hell do I need to get, you know, a barricaded door and two dogs and a gun and cameras all over the house and, you know, safe room downstairs. Right. Cause I have no risk. I mean, I, is that the mindset that's getting people in trouble these days or. No, I think, I think a big part of it might get people caught up in the blinky lights. You know, I, I think some people are so in tuned or so ingrained with the sexy side of security where, You've got a, a guy sitting in a dark room in his basement with a hoodie on, and he's looking at the matrix screen for 24 hours out of the day. Where, you know, my focus a lot has been on the unsexy side of security policy, standards, procedures, governance, and risk. Um, and, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't know the business, and you don't know the products that the business provides, you are not doing yourself any good to the business whatsoever in evaluating the overall security posture of everything. Um, It it really comes down to that. And if you're not getting that executive buy-in, then you might as well find someplace else to go because nobody's got your back. Businesses are interesting these days and what they perceive themselves to be. Randy, do you remember what was it that Ford was trying to spin that they're a software company now and Uh, not a car company? I thought it was GM. It was a GM, one of the two. And then new lowercase logo. and Right, right. And it's like, you know, it's getting into then, okay. Yeah, yeah, if you're a software company now, uh, that kind of changes what I thought of you 
to protect what I need to protect. Do you follow what I'm saying? Like, you know, at the end of the day, they're a car company, but they're trying to say they're not to try to stay ahead of it. Do you follow where I'm going with this? Like when you're, when you're assessing the business risk and these businesses are always trying to evolve and change what they are um, mm-hmm. compared to what they've been. Um, I guess it's constantly evolving. And I guess, you know, it's just like security. It's not like you can rest tomorrow. You can't. Um, if you're not learning something new tomorrow, you're, you're getting, you're screwed. You're a day behind. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're already, you're already behind. That's, that's right. Um, and, and I, I get what you're, I get what you're saying. I, you know, I, I get what you're asking. Um, but it's not that simple of a, an answer. And I, no, I get that. Um, you know, I, I, I always, I, I like, and I, I think it was John O that said this, you know, in security, I don't want to see a new product unless you get rid of two products that do the exact same thing as this new one that you're, you're putting in. Sure. And, and the reason behind that is, is because you're, you're getting rid of technical debt. Go ahead and drink for the buzzword. And, uh, <laughs> you only said it once. So they were good. <laughs> and uh, you know, you're, you're alleviating the complexity of the network. You know, how many, how many millions of dollars have organizations pissed away installing a bunch of blinky lights that are 5% deployed, 10% deployed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's the biggest, it's the biggest challenge for my profession being in IT sales, as long as I've been in it, is, and I've had these conversations with peers my entire career, and it's, especially when you're selling security, that you, you have to sell a philosophy but the problem is I get paid on, I get paid and fired on product and hired and fired on product. Mm -hmm. So I have to have this conversation revolving around, you know, where your head's at revolve revolving around your philosophy, implement mine. But at the end of the day, I got to sell you one little small piece of this puzzle and I can't do anything else about everything else. And, and we're pigeonholed into that. So here you have all these people just trying to push product um, that want to talk philosophy because I think you have to, um, but we're stuck, you know, our, our jobs, our, our livelihoods and our families depend on me pushing this one skew. Um, mm-hmm. you know, so that's why, you know, I, I don't know, like, again, you know, everybody that calls on you, they're trying to sell their thing, right. Whether it be, you know, Hey, buy my VPN client. It's faster, man. You know, I, I can't imagine the stuff that gets thrown at you. Um, you can rag uh, on it. That's fine. I, you know, I, I, I do have a, a good funny story. I mean, I, we were going through and doing cyber insurance, you know, renewing our, our uh, policy for the year. And we had one company come to us and, and tell us, Hey, we've got this great EDR product. You have to install it on every endpoint, every server in your environment, or we won't insure you. And this was a company out of the UK. So I don't know. Cyber insurance company said that. that. Yeah, and I don't know if this was because they're in the UK and the lawns are different, but it, it, there was a lot of red flags that were being thrown up in the air. And uh, it was a, a $1.5 million cost over three years for the management of this software too. And we're just like, how does, how does that work? You, you you whitelist all of the applications that are on the endpoint. You have, you make us wait seven days so you can install and explode out all of the files to see where they install so you can whitelist wherever they're going. And then if we have a problem, the turnaround time is four hours. That's where I get into a big philosophical you know debate on whether or not you go manage or if you go with your own or roll your own. Right. Because companies can't wait seven days. They can't wait four hours. If something's happening within their network, they need immediate response time. And, and a lot of these service providers are, are sitting on their hands. You know, we, we, we were talking to uh, an identity provider once and they wanted three days to turn around and create an Active Directory account for a new employee. 
that seems ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's simple stuff, but you know, when you've got all of these, these vendors that are coming after you and, and trying to sell you things and, and their next big product or their next big solution, um, you know, it, it's, it's funny that the things that they, they throw at you and say that, you know, the Barracudas install this firewall and, you know, you'll be 100% protected, right? It's they don't tell you that, way. do they? Please don't tell me they tell you that. God yeah, almighty. I wish I would have took a picture of the banner in, at uh, DTW that, that they had up a couple years back. That's a, that's That's borderline... Sad. There's nothing, you know. That was the that was the guy that came up to me at a networking event and said, "My data center's got 100 percent uptime." Mm-hmm. I said, "Well, you guys been open two hours." <laughs> and he said, "You know," and I'm like, "You're not. It's in. Wait a minute. It's in. I'm not going to say what suburb of Detroit it's in, but you're in suburb of Detroit. So everybody will know who it is when I say it. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have redundant power anywhere. There's there are very few facilities that do." Um, I yeah great you have eight carriers and that doesn't mean you have 100 percent uptime give me you know d- please don't you know tell me five nines I'll be like okay cool you know but I mean give me you know it, it's almost la- I had to bring over a couple nerds that I knew and like you got to listen to what this guy says you know telling me 100 percent and that's the problem though when you have that's why my pro- you know profession gets a bad rep because you have reps out there that'll say stupid things like that. And marketing folks that'll say stupid things like that and put banners up at DTW, um, it just makes yeah, it gives a bad name for everything. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, that was the thing that was a part of the compliance issue that I had. We had to implement EDR, and the it went from a fifty thousand dollar deductible. And if we didn't have EDR implemented, it went to like a $500,000 deductible, right? Wow. Like if you didn't have these check marks checked, um, MFA as well. So we had to do, we had to do two projects literally in two weeks. Um, but it's, you know, it's interesting to me, like, but then they recommended the product we put in. So you wonder, like you were talking about, it seemed weird with that company out of the UK, like, you know, they're like, Hey, we recommend this product. And it's like, wait, you're, you're recommending a product. Can, you know, can I evaluate? Um, so you wonder how many of them have infiltrated the insurance side. Um, yeah. But then when you looked at, I don't remember if it's seven or eight of the top 10 cyber insurance companies are profitable. The other two are losing their ass. They took baths. Um, a couple of them did on, on some big payouts um, because the companies now are just saying, hey, I got insurance, just pay it, you know. So now it's just like I got car insurance. I can drive like an asshole because if I smash it up, they're going to pay for it. Yeah. A new car. And it's kind of like this. Like, I don't, you know, it's almost like they're being reckless with it because they know they have insurance. Right. Yeah. And and they don't want to pay out on the policies because they don't, the, the other companies aren't taking it seriously. And, you know, I'm probably one of, I'm probably the only one that, that was a fan of PCI. Um, everybody else I, I talked to, you know, they hated it for one reason or another, but you really had to look at what PCI was trying to achieve. And that was continuous security, not a checkbox and time type of evaluation of your overall security for your environment. And that's that's the way people have taken it. Uh, they they see IT as a black hole, and they don't want to invest in their organization to protect their their intellectual property. And and uh, you know they they see it as a checky box. And I don't if you look at it, it de- I guess it depends. So you have some industries that are not techy. You know, we have a couple clients that aren't techy, and a couple people I work I've worked with in the past that aren't techy. Let's say that you know they. You know, one of them is an oil company. Right? They got trucks that have oil on the street. Um, there was really no need for them ever to be techy, uh, but now they have to like check all these boxes and put in a sim and put in EDR and put in MFA and you know now you have these people that have worked in those offices for thirty years that are like, "Are you effing kidding me? I got to do all this crap now." Mm-hmm. Um, 
it's it's a struggle. Then you have other people that are like, I ain't putting shit on my phone. Um, okay, great. Now we have to order. Now we have to order you a keychain token that's going to cost this and that. So I mean, you have you have a lot of people that still fight this system when you have people trying to do the right thing. Um, but you have a lot of you know, especially in Detroit. I mean, how how many AS four hundreds are out there that are sitting in that closet that haven't been t- haven't re- been rebooted in ten years? You know, uh, it's it's a thing, right? Yeah. Um, and that's got to you know, it's got to keep guys like you up at night. Not to use the drink on that one too. What yeah. keeps you up at night? Um, besides infomercials. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's that legacy, that old stuff. You know, and, and the people that are stuck in their ways and old businesses that you know that yeah, this is a this is a cost, and I hate its guts. Mm-hmm. But it's on the flip side, it's the the whole cost of doing business. I mean, Today. you still have to follow OSHA rules, my OSHA rules. You still have to follow a bunch of other safety requirements. I mean, why is cybersecurity any different? And and that is. I guess something I will never understand. You know, I, I, I used to put on a, a workshop called Security on a Shoestring, um, where you could develop a lot of your cybersecurity policy and even utilize, you know, a lot of technical resources to accomplish what you needed to for not that much money. And you'd still be able to achieve, you know, a halfway decent security for your organization. Um, I, I think people either don't understand and they have the, it's not going to happen to me mentality, or they do have the, it's not going to happen to me mentality and they just don't care. I mean, if you look at, you know, the Wendy's breach, couple years ago when, sure. when people were uh, grabbing credit card numbers off of the memory in the, in the card reader, how many people actually left Wendy's to take their business elsewhere? So we talk about that all the time, Jason, Home Depot, Wendy's, Tylenol cyanide pills. People don't, yeah, the, the, those sales went up. Do you remember that case study? Mm-hmm. Those, yeah, nobody cares. Like, nobody cares. I think, because these stories come out every day, you know, and it just gets to the point where it, just, it becomes white noise. It becomes numb. And I'll be damned if I'm not going to get my Dave's double, you know, that's right. It's damn good. Or my buddy's spicy chicken. That's his thing. Best, best chicken sandwich. <laughs> Speaking of, no, I was going to get into a whole food thing. No, no. But see, like I, I, um, I call it poor man's zero trust. So, like, when you deal a lot with small businesses, 200, 300, 400 seat clients, 100 seat clients under that, I think they want the fancy stuff. And But, but again, though, you're not going to buy all those t- tools and things. So, I came up with what I called Poor Man's Zero Trust, and I ran it by a CISO friend of mine uh, that's pretty well respected, and he kind of gave me the, the stamp of approval. So, that's what we go to market with, right? And it's, it's a shoestring. Yeah, it's kind of like what you were just saying. Um, it gets you kind of where you need to go, and it's not all the bells and whistles. It's not as flashy, you know. It's a, you know, it's a piece of crap body old Ford, but it's got a damn good engine in it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to use a think of a bad analogy, but uh, I think you get you get you're the point. The right, right. I mean, you're you, you know. I think these these small businesses, like now, you see some very small businesses that are under some very stringent because that that. You, what were you, how long ago was that two, three pages for cyber insurance requirements? And now it's what, 50, oh. 60, 80? Yeah. You know, and so now it's like the, in the beginning, it was easy. Oh, shit. Yeah, I got a this and I got a that. Now it's no, no, no. There's like 60, you got to, you know, you got to bring in counsel. You got to bring in, you know, some heavy hitters just to get through this document. It's bananas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and they're not taking your word for it anymore. They're they're going through and they're doing their audits, they're doing their assessments, they're doing their due diligence to make sure that when you're hitting that checky box, that you actually have it implemented, configured, policies are written for it. You know, they're they're doing a good damn good job at it. It's just some of these outfits, you know, that some of their requirements, I I, I don't get. 
I really don't. You'd like to think that they're using someone to help them write it because they're not writing it themselves. And, you know, I don't know if they're bringing in a hacker per se or a consulting firm or, you know what I'm saying? Like someone's writing those for them. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're turning around and taking techie individuals off the street and making them policy writers, which right. good or bad. I, I don't know. I, that's, you could probably do a whole podcast just on that and, and we, try and get a perspective, but it, it'd be, it'd be interesting to, to know, um, you know, how these insurance companies are benefiting and profiting off from, you know, these, these various partnerships with cybersecurity providers. Exactly. I think I, there's, there's something there. It's, you know, there's smoke. It's just got to, got to find the fire. It reminds me of the conversations we've always had about Hollywood. And when they do something really stupid from a technical front, you know, like you couldn't have called one goddamn geek that you could have looked up on LinkedIn to, to, to pay them two hours of consulting to tell you that that looks ridiculous. Do it this way, you know, because, mm-hmm. you know, there's people that it ruins the whole movie. Randy, what movie was that? Oh, the, the stupid uh, free guy. When there's like a on the first it's in like the main lobby and there's like a huge sign and there's like data center arrow. And I'm like pointing at it. and I'm like yelling at my wife going, that'll never happen. That's bullshit. <laughs> it's never, on the you know, the fact that it's in the lobby, but the fact that it's labeled, I go, those things are. You know, I remember when um, the certain uh, mortgage company downtown Detroit that uh, rhymes with uh, Schmrocket um, put like their neon signs all over their data center. It's like, no, 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 no. Like we all drive by the, the, the telephone COs, right? What do they look like? Like wh- you don't know if it's a water pumping station or, or a data center or, or whatever it is, but it, I don't know what the hell it is yeah. for good reason. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, yeah, they could have called one nerd, and he would have just said, "Nope, nope, that's no, that's not a thing." Like, yeah. don't don't ever do that again. My favorite video is from NCIS, where they've got two people pounding away on one keyboard. I love that. I love that. And what the best uh, scene ever? Oh yeah, on somebody's one trying keyboard. To, somebody's trying to hack their uh, after this is their over. lab. So. The, the lab person starts typing away and then their security guy starts typing on the same keyboard with her to try and like they're, they're trying to faster find than the hacker. hacker or something. It reminds me of like that awful scene in Weird Science when they're on like the, the 300 baud modem with the phone docking thing and mm-hmm. like they're going down paths and you can't go down this one because there's a skull and crossbones there and they're like oh no like this one's open and they go to, it's like they're playing a, a game like Skyrim to, to hack it anyway it's oh, yeah yeah that yeah, reminds me of Lawnmower Man. Did you ever watch that? Absolutely. Horrible, amazing, awful, great. It's everything in between. Like, it's just one of those, like, I love it, I hate it, I love it, I hate it, you know. Yeah. Well, that was, uh, I was going to joke with you when you said you went to Black Hat. I'm like, did you see Liam Neeson there? Or Liam Neeson, Liam uh, Helmsworth there? Or, uh, or did you see Thor there because of that stupid movie called Black Hat? Like, we need a black hat. And there was those awful commercials for it. You don't know what I'm talking about? No. Oh, my God. I'm sending you the link when we uh, <laughs> finish this. It was literally it had Thor and like something was going on. And the guy goes like, he's like, we need a black hat. And they hire Thor because, of course, all the hackers look like Thor. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it, like, it missed the mark on so many different like, you know, you make a movie called Black Hat. and You don't freaking have real like real industry people helping you write this crap. Like it's awful. <laughs> Oh, and but the the trailer was the worst. I like I almost swore it off for life. I'm like I've never seen this piece of turd movie, unless it's like forced down my throat on a Saturday afternoon, um, on like WTBS or something. You know, just some free garbage now Netflix, whatever. Um, but anyway, um, we're getting close to the end, Jason. And I mean, any uh, I know I threw a softball at you. To, any uh, crazy stories lately? And I know it's a loose question, but uh, anything? Uh, any any stories to end with, or we can. Uh, you know what, to, to send it off, you know what the, the number one password was to use in 2021? Please don't tell me it's still password. No, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. The and same that, combination as my luggage? Exactly. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yep. So that, my friends, is the reason why we're failing. How many is admin, admin? Is those, like... Was that even in the top three? No. 
No, it was all the numbers again. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No. Ugh. QWERTY. QWERTY didn't even make the list, I don't think. Wow. wow. And Password didn't make the list? And I don't remember if Password made it or not. I'd have to go back and look. That's funny. Uh, Jason, appreciate the time, as always. Uh, you can find you on LinkedIn. Uh, we'll, we'll post a link on, on show notes. But uh, appreciate the insight. Uh, you're always a wealth of knowledge, and uh, love having you on the show. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in person sometime soon. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, thank you much. I appreciate it. All right, all the best. On behalf of uh, Bob and Randy, do us all a favor. Drink up your drinks, get your phone numbers. You don't got to go home. You just got to get the hell out of here. On behalf of the IT and the D Show episode 419, beat it.